And so we're really we're delighted to have um, Lorette Cohen and Dr. Lee Justin. Justin. Justin, excuse me. Justin. Today they're speaking about the new anti-Semitism Israel model, an empirical approach to modern anti-Semitism. Lorette Cohen is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at, Col at the College of Staten Island as part of the CUNY system. And she's also an ad hoc reviewer for, of the American Journal of Media Psychology, the Journal of Applied Social Psychology, uh, and McGraw-Hill Psychology, Psychology Texts, right? And you are a member of the Eastern Psychological Association, the American Psychological Association, and the Society for the Psychology Study of Social Issues. Um, she's did her PhD at Rutgers in social psychology, and she's held various positions, and she's widely published in co-authored books and the like. Um, sorry, Lee Jessam is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Rutgers University, and he sits on the Rutgers University's Dean Committee to uh, reorganize the program of criminal justice. Sounds like a serious uh, I'm actually now chair of that program. They, they eventually made me chair of that program, which yeah, never mind. Right. <laughs> University, uh, uh, and also, uh, you saw the Criminal Justice Program Committee. Um, and he was the Vice Chair of Graduate Studies in the Department of Psychology at Rutgers in 2001 2006. And he has been at Rutgers as an assistant, associate, and now a full professor since 1987. And he did his PhD at the University of Michigan. He also is involved in all sorts of uh, fascinating research projects um, and has and substantial grants and NSF grants and the like to do your work and has authored and co-authored books and uh, is widely published as well. So it's really thank you for coming up here today and we're looking forward to hearing your, your paper. Thank you. Thank, you. Well, thank you all for being here. It's been a pleasure uh, so far. and. Uh, I think we're almost ready to move in, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to start off with the question of why anyone should take anti-Semitism seriously. And <coughs> at least for us, where we were going to be studying this issue in New Jersey, this was really an important, you know, it's a serious question because, you know, the United States is one of the least anti-Semitic countries uh, the North, you know, New Jersey, the Northeast U.S. is one of the least anti-Semitic regions in that least anti-Semitic of countries. And since World War II, uh, Jews have been incredibly successful, especially in the Democratic West, but also in Israel. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a bit of a cold, so I'm going to probably stop and cough and all that kind of stuff. And drink more than usual. Um, and uh, research on prejudice, stereotypes, discrimination uh, usually focuses on understanding oppressed groups, disadvantage, and inequality. And appropriately, justifiably, has focused primarily on uh, sexism, racism, prejudice against minority, ethnic minorities, homophobia, and the like. And uh, Israelis are uh, often seen as oppressors rather than disadvantaged and so forth. And so the question of why study anti-Semitism, I think, has a certain uh, uh, importance, a certain urgency that uh, uh, is uh, <coughs> not quite so obvious. I mean, it needs to be addressed compared to other kinds of groups. And so this talk, this presentation that we're doing today, is actually divided into two parts. Uh, I'm going to be handling the first part, and Florence is going to be handling the second part. Uh, the first part is uh, basically non-experimental evidence, uh, which we've subtitled Nasty Hints and Whispers, The Return of Anti-Semitism, purposely with a question mark. And it has a question mark there because none of the evidence that I'm going to be reviewing uh, is particularly clear or definitive. That is, there are, for each example, each instance that I'm going to discuss, there are explanations other than anti-Semitism for these various events. Most are anecdotal. There's a little bit of data in there. Um, but this atmosphere, these kinds of events, are how Ferret and I came to see a possible reemergence of anti Semitism as something that warranted empirical experimental study. Okay. 
Uh, so a few years ago, just in, for other purposes entirely, I was perusing census data, U.S. census data, and I was more perplexed than anything else to discover that Jews <coughs> in the United States <coughs> Okay, I, I'm sorry, this is the cold offense. Um, Jews in the United States are victimized by hate crimes proportionately more than other uh, religious um, and ethnic minority groups. So that's shown in this uh, uh, slide here. The, um, the blue bars represent, the, uh, according to the census, the number of bias uh, crimes committed against each of these four groups. And that's in the hundreds. Um, the red bars are the population in thousands, in, sorry, millions of each of the groups. And you know, the, the thing that stands out here, you don't really need to process each and every number, is that for Jews, Jews the only group for whom the blue bar is higher than the red bar. You know, it's not higher in absolute numbers. This is blue bars in hundreds, this is in red bars in millions. But what that does mean is that <clears throat> Jews in the United States are victimized by hate crimes proportionately more than any of these other groups. Now, absolute numbers wax with victimized way more than Jews, but Jews disproportionately compared to the numbers in the population. Uh, on top of that, the last few years, a slew of quite diverse organizations have produced uh, reports highlighting the reemergence of anti-Semitism. So there's this uh, PBS documentary, um, and as well as reports by the US State Department and Human Rights First, which is a US-based you know, you know, sort of non-profit uh, human rights type organization. And obviously, you know, we can't go into a lot of detail on any of this stuff here, but I think just the section headings from the Human Rights First report convey some sense of the breadth and depth of anti-Semitism here now. You know, the titles, like extreme violence, everyday harassment, attacks, so forth and so on, down to, you know, resurgent anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, just, just, you know, you don't need a lot of detail to get a sense of at least what they believe. In our reading through, or in the case of PBS documentary, uh, uh, this stuff, we sort of observed, extracted several sort of common themes from, the <coughs> from these reports. You have this sort of weird merging of medieval European anti-Semitism with modern Arab hostility to Israel. And we will illustrate exactly what we mean by that a few slides down the road. You have the sort of reemergence of conspiracy theories involving Jews, sort of a virulent anti-Zionism, demonization of Israel, and the linking of, uh, of events involving Israel to physical and verbal attacks on Jews. This is like sort of our extraction of this, or abstraction of some of the main ideas in those reports. Now, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of these examples, but perhaps not all of them. So we all know about the uh, 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 Iranian president Ahmadinejad calling for Israel, Israel to be wiped off the map. And there was a sort of tempest in a teapot about whether that was translated correctly, the alternative being released from the pages of time, which I know makes me feel a lot better about his <laughs> um, You had a report in the English version of Al Jazeera suggesting that Israel was responsible for the September 11th attacks. Uh, you have a report in an Egyptian newspaper uh, suggesting that Israel, uh, Israeli nuclear testing might have caused the Indonesian tsunami that killed almost thousands and thousands of people. Um, and then uh, there's the infamous speech by the uh, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, of which I've only extracted a particularly uh, uh, pungent section here. The Jews invented and successfully promoted socialism communism, human rights, and democracy. <laughs> that gets better. So that persecuting them would appear to be wrong. It's not wrong. These were things concocted by Jews so that people would think it's wrong to persecute them. <laughs> so they may enjoy equal rights with others. With these, they have now gained control of the most powerful country. Malaysia. Okay. Now, these are all Arab or Islamic sources, and if you thought that um, this kind of stuff was restricted to Arab or Islamic sources, you would be wrong. Um, you have British acad uh, academic unions, 
periodically on and off, sometimes reversing themselves, voting to engage in academic boycotts of Israel, but not of other countries. You have a slew of American and British uh, churches uh, voting or considering votes to divest, remove their investments from Israel, uh, but not from other countries. And you know, it's possible, one might think, that such actions involve a deep and sincere concern with human rights. And maybe they do. But when juxtaposed against some of the other countries in the world that, as far as I can tell, are perpetrating vastly worse human rights violations than Israel, it at least raised sort of a set of yellow and, and red flags for us that maybe there's something going on here other than the sincere concern about human rights. <coughs> okay, so then you have this uh, sort of weird blending of medieval anti-Semitic motifs with modern hostility to Israel, which uh, is nicely captured by this sort of next series of slides of uh, modern political cartoons. So this one is not modern at all. This is actually a Nazi era cartoon. I don't know how much you can see that. This is an octopus sinking its tentacles into the whole world with a little Jewish star over its head. Well, actually, this kind of uh, cartoon was used at the Nuremberg trials uh, to argue that the uh, Nazis intentionally tried to trump up uh, hatred of Jews in order to perpetrate the Holocaust. What you have here is an Egyptian cartoon from a few years ago that, as far as I can tell, is exactly the same thing. Then you have here another Nazi era cartoon of uh, President Roosevelt. So the Jewish candelabra, the idea that Roosevelt is somehow serving the Jews. Yeah, that's Nazi era cartoon. That's not modern. But you have this American cartoon showing Unc Uncle Sam shackled by the Jewish star. <coughs> <coughs> and then there's this Nazi era cartoon, one eats the other, and the Jew devours them all. The gigantic moving Jew chewing up first China, which is chewing up the United States. That's the British Lion, you know, World War II era, era tune. And then you have this, uh, which shows former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon devouring the Palestinian baby amidst the wreckage of war. And this cartoon is just so revolting that you might think, I mean, who would concoct such a cartoon other than someone on the front lines of the conflict with Israel, a member of Hamas, of Hezbollah, some of the Palestinian, Syrian, maybe a Lebanese source. But if you thought that, you would be wrong. Uh, this was actually a British cartoon. Um, and not, you know, not only was this a British cartoon, uh, this British cartoon won the award that year for the best political cartoon in Britain. So not only is it British, the British think this is great stuff, You know, when I put these two side by side like this, you know, and I ask myself two questions, which is more viscerally revolting? The answer is obviously that one. If I further ask myself, well, if I had to have my children exposed to one or the other, which would I prefer? My choice would be the Nazi cartoon. Okay, now I'm not suggesting that Britain or Egypt or any other country is about to embark on some sort of new attempt to slaughter Jews, but what I am saying is that the demonization of Israel and the blending of these sort of old and new anti-Semitic motifs is nicely demonstrated in this set of political cartoons. Okay, let's talk about the UN. Uh, in some of the casual circles I travel, it's well known that the UN hates Israel. And I never knew what to make of that. Like, you know, it's like a political discussion that's fine, uh, but we're empirically oriented social psychologists. So once we started doing this kind of stuff, we asked ourselves, well, is, is there a way to actually find out whether that's true? Or is this just sort of like Jews being defensive and kind of threatened and all this kind of stuff. So 
Um, the way we attempted to address this was by asking the question, does the UN pay disproportionate attention to Israel? Which, to, to address that question, we needed to break it down into its two parts. Well, first, what does it mean to pay attention to Israel? Well, it's not like we're going to sit around in general assembly meetings. So what we did, what we discovered, this was great, this was completely amazing. The UN has a very extensive website, um, and part of the website includes the, what used to be the Human Rights Council, um, it's now the Commission on Human Rights, maybe not the worst, maybe it used to be the Commission on Human Rights, now it's the Human Rights Council. And you can search that site for every document on any country in the UN. So we just did that. And what basically what we did was we searched for every official UN document in the Human Rights Council on each of the six countries, uh, each of six countries, one of which was Israel. And what I'll be presenting now is just the count of the number of documents on each of the countries. This is one objective measure of how much attention the UN Human Rights Commission is paying. Now, the question is, you know, does the UN pay disproportionate attention to Israel? So, to, to Israel. So, the, disproportionate compared to what? How would you know if it was proportionate? Well, you know, I mean, the province of the Human Rights Council or the Commission is human rights. So, we're thinking in proportion to human rights issues. But that's really kind of a problem, right? Because, you know, how do you compare different kinds of human rights violations? So, like, which is a more serious human rights violation? The Saudi Arabian uh, denial of women the right to vote, or the Israelis conducting a security fence that divides up Palestinian neighborhoods? I don't know. Different reasonable people can differ around that. So, rather than get bogged down into these sort of subjective and fuzzy areas of human rights, we figured we would go right to the ultimate human rights violation, which is civilian death. I mean, it doesn't get any worse than killing somebody who doesn't deserve to be killed. So, uh, that's going to be, so that's going to be the question here is, is the amount of attention, uh, attention paid by the UN to Israel proportionate to the amount of civilian death? Now, what you see on this slide is the amount of <coughs> in some cases, estimates of civilian death in each of six countries, purposely not identified here, I'll get to identifying them in a minute, ranges from about 800,000 down to a few thousand. Okay, so that's the death toll in thousands. This slide is just the number of UN documents on each of these six countries, just in the actual number. So there's about 750, 300, a little over 200, so forth and so on. Now, if the UN was paying proportionate attention to each of these countries, you would expect a pattern kind of like this. You know, it's not that the red exactly equals the blue, but it'd be more or less a correspondence. The greater amount of civilian death, the greater amount of attention, more or less most of the time with some sort of random variation and some sort of minor differences. But if you thought that that's what was going on, you would be wrong. So now what I have up here are the six countries um, that we selected and the, in some cases, estimates of the amount of death in this time period, 1990 to 2007. Um, and then what's going to come up next is the amount of UN attention, as indicated by this sort of search for documents, on each of these uh, countries. And so uh, by this measure, it becomes pretty vividly clear that, yes, indeed, the UN does play disproportionate attention to Israel, um, which is sort of nice account by this political party, showing a sort of desperate, starving Sudanese kid trying to get into the United Nations, but can't because they are out denouncing Israel. <coughs> just chokes you all up inside. <laughs> <laughs> that's, just, that's just the leftover phlegm, sorry. <laughs> Jews disproportionately victimized uh, by hate crimes, even in the United States. 
You have a slew of political cartoons smacking or even exceeding Nazi era propaganda. You have this sort of virulent hostility to Israel that seems to go beyond opposition and disagreement. And that does not seem to be matched by similar hostility to countries or regimes involved in either similar or sometimes far worse uh, human rights violations than you get in, uh, in, in Israel. And this seems to be especially true with the United Nations. But there's problems with all of this. Uh, you know, you put it together and it smells bad, but you know, in, this is all real world, world data. Not, none of it is definitive evidence of anti-Semitism. So for example, you know, US hate crimes, well maybe Jews just report hate crimes more than other groups. You know, the, all that UN attention, well, that's not really anti-Semitism, that's about oil and power and alliances and all sorts of other stuff. You, you have these sort of harsh cartoons uh, hostile to Israel, well, so what? You know, political cartoonists are over the top to everyone. Just get over it and get used to it. Um, you have these sort of government and media reports, well, everyone knows all these organizations have their own agendas, they're all biased, and you can't believe everything that you read. So into this mix, it eventually occurred, really first to Florent. And then it's like, yeah, you know, this is a job. Figuring this out is a job for a social psychologist. Because social psychologists are really good at teasing out prejudice and stereotyping as explanations for people's hostility to individuals and groups from other explanations, because social psychologists have been doing this for 100 years, or almost 100 years. And that is what led us to this line of research, which Florent is going to present. <laughs> okay, so thank you for having us again. I'm really excited to be able to present this research um, for you. So uh, we started talking about all the different kind of phenomena that actually can manifest itself as either blatant or subtle anti-Semitism, um, but. You know, that led us to the main question of this research, which is, does anti-Semitism sometimes manifest itself as hostility to Israel? So given the amount of condemnation that Israel receives in the UN and pretty much every place else, which is, if not always, at least most of the time, accompanied by, you know, denials of anti-Semitism, and there's really very little empirical research to date on this stuff, we said it would be appropriate for us to assess Right? whether um, these, these events of hostility to Israel indeed reflect anti-Semitism. So we, we pretty much came up with these questions. And the first one is, does expressing hostility to Israel constitute a safe way to express anti-Semitism? And if so, if this really is the case, then how can we distinguish hostility to Israel that is versus is not anti-Semitism? Right? Maybe we're just pretty much saying, well, anyone who criticizes Israel is an anti-Semite, which is pretty much what the claims have been. <coughs> but we want to try to, as Lee said, tease that apart empirically to demonstrate or to at least try to suggest that that's not always the case. Now, in order to do that, we need an experimental manipulation, right? Something that will increase, yeah, right? Something that's going to actually increase anti-Semitism for that experimental group over control group. Now, the experimental manipulation we chose is the mortality salience manipulation. And I'm, I'm going to get into this in about a moment, but just keep in mind that this manipulation is one that manipulates thoughts of one's own death. Now, um, I am, I guess, I guess I'm a tenant management theorist, right? Oh, at, least, at least that's what Sheldon Solomon would say. Um, at least I was trained by the original terror management theorists, Solomon, Greenberg, and Pazinski. Um, and TMT is based on Ernest Becker's birth and death of meaning and denial of death. And what Becker said was that human beings, we are incredibly, incredibly smart creatures, right? We're a lot smarter than every other creature, right? Than, than, than animals and bugs and amoeba. But the one thing that we have in common with all these creatures is the will to survive. Okay? Um, Unfortunately, though, as really intelligent creatures, we are the only creatures that are um, aware of the, of the inevitability of death. So we know we're going to die. And what's worse, 
we know it can happen at any time. So I could step outside from this building when I'm done and get hit by a bus or fall down one of your construction holes or maybe or maybe one of those, you know, one of those those hate mail letters I've been getting could be laced with cyanide or something wonderful like that. Or maybe an Arab kid can chase me down the block at school for, you know, for telling them that, you know, that Israel has a right to exist. You just you just never know. It could occur at any time. And you know what? The thought of that, if we really were to sit down and think of that on a constant basis, we would just kind of like cringe in a corner somewhere and start to roll up in a little ball and cry for mommy at, at, at every turn. And that's, that's not good. So luckily, as human beings, we were also intelligent enough to be able to kind of control that anxiety. And, and to manage that anxiety, people deny that physical death actually implies absolute annihilation. So yeah, well, maybe my body's gonna die, but that doesn't mean that I'm gonna die in spirit. Right? And this is maintained through what we call a cultural worldview. What is a cultural worldview, you ask? Well, a cultural worldview is d defined by the TMT group as a humanly constructed belief about the nature of reality shared by individuals in a group, okay? And it provides this conception of the universe, and as long as it's followed, it imbues the world with order, meaning, and permanence, which sets the standards of valued behavior. Now, I'm an Orthodox Jew, and as an Orthodox Jew, I have certain beliefs. I believe that as long as I keep all the, uh, you know, uh, 613 laws that I've been commanded, then life is going to be really good for me, I'm going to be rewarded, and then I'm going to go on to a greater place in heaven, and yeah, my body will die, my kids will sit shiva for me, but you know what? I'm going to live on forever. I have gone to a better place. Okay? And Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, pretty much you know, most of the world religions, maybe not all, but most of the world religions have this concept of some kind of afterlife. Um, and this really does minimize death anxiety by those promises of immortality. And, and this is a literal immortality, because I'm physically going to die, but the rest of me is going to live on forever. Now, you say, well, Florette, what about those atheists, right? They don't believe in religion. What's going to happen to them? Well, this works for them as well. Because in this case, we can have what we call a symbolic immortality. In, in a sense that maybe someone goes out and they write a great book. Or they become a great actress. And then their spirit lives on in movies or books forever. Maybe they become really, really rich. And they donate lots and lots of money, oh, I don't know, maybe to Yale. <laughs> and then you put their, you know, their name on a building, and you know, then they live on forever on that building, right? You get to see the name every day. Okay. Now, support for terror management theory has been obtained in over 400 published studies. I can't believe it's 400. When I started giving this talk, we were at 200. The world has changed a lot in a couple of years. Um, and there, the experiments have been conducted by independent researchers across 15 countries based on this following hypothesis. Okay. So if psychological structures provide protection from the potential for death-related anxiety, then reminders of death should intensify efforts to uphold these psychological structures. And again, this is basically our cultural worldview. So as long as I believe in the set of standards set by my culture, I'm going to minimize death anxiety. Okay. And the way it's done is pretty much participants are given two open-ended questions to answer. Okay? Um, the first one begins like this. Describe the thoughts that your own death arouses in you, and describe what you think will happen to you as you physically die and once you are dead. Um, parallel, parallel questions about, uh, about unpleasant but non-lethal events are the control condition. So, um, we ask these participants to answer these two open-ended questions. In the experimental condition, they're answering questions about death. In the control condition, they're answering questions about an upcoming exam or some kind of pain, maybe a dental pain, maybe paralysis, anything anxiety-provoking but having nothing to do with death. And um, the important thing to keep in mind here is that even though participants are answering these questions, we're not looking at them. We're not analyzing them. We just want to bring um, thoughts of one's own death into consciousness. Okay. Um, now, if you, if you hark back to the events of 9-11, what you can see, what, what you can remember, if you remember correctly, was a real-life 
mortality salience manipulation. So I know that, I don't know, does anybody here remember where they were during 9-11? 9-11, anybody? I see lots of nods. I, I remember very well where I was during 9-11. I was in New York, which was, oh, just such a wonderful place to be. <laughs> um, there was lots and lots and lots of smoke. I lived in Brooklyn, and there was paper, burnt paper falling into my backyard. The sky was black. I mean, we could smell. We could just smell burnt bodies and metal. It was just an awful feeling. But what was interesting, even more so, was what happened on the day after 9-11. Right? All of a sudden, flags went up. Like, American flags went up in every house on the block. And all of a sudden, the cars, right? They had these little suction flags stuck to their windows, and you could see them driving down the block. So there were all these flags and these feelings of unity, right? People were singing songs and God bless America. And there were charity events, right? They had a whole telethon, a 24-hour telethon. Please donate, please give. They opened up the blood banks. There were all kinds of helping behaviors. And unfortunately, we also saw some ethnic attacks against people that at least appeared to be of Middle Eastern descent, okay? Mm -hmm. And I began to question, why do people have these responses? What's going on here? And do they reflect some sort of psychological need? I mean, what, what really is happening? Well, studies have demonstrated, right? Terror management studies have pretty much showed us that <coughs> Christians' attractions to other Christians increase. So pretty much, we develop a liking, a greater liking, for people who share our cultural worldviews. Okay? Germans' physical distance from a Turkish confederate spread more apart, right? That increased as well. Basically saying, you know what? We don't like people who don't share our cultural worldview. We dislike them. They don't believe in what we believe. And finally, there was an increase in judges sentencing of prostitutes. And this is going to become important later. This is what we call a moral transgression effect. And our culture prescribes some kind of moral code that we need to live by. Therefore, if people don't adhere to that moral code, we punish them. And right, if we think of thoughts of, thoughts of our own death, it'll make us punish them even more so. Okay. Now, one of the great things about the mortality salience manipulation was some of the earliest work using this manipulation showed that increased Christians' hostility to Jews. <laughs> well, look at that. This has pretty much been done already. So what am I doing here? I just, I just felt like talking to you. That's, that's pretty much it. So I'm done now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just playing with you. All right, so the main questions then for this research were, could we replicate mortality salience manipulation's effect on anti-Semitism? Right, so we, we got to start with that. Can we replicate this stuff? Okay. The second one was, does mortality salience also increase hostility to Israel? And this is where it starts to become unique, right? <laughs> Does this occur because mortality salience increases anti-Semitism? Or is there something else going on here, right? Maybe there's something we're not really catching. So here's what we did. We took 76 non-Jewish Rutgers University intro psych students, and they were assigned <coughs> either to the mortality salience or exam salience condition. For the dependent variable, they were asked to answer 23 questions on a scale, on a Likert scale of one to five, one being the least anti-Semitism, five being the most anti-Semitism. We used the Levinson and Sanford's revised, we revised the Levinson and Sanford's anti-Semitism scale, okay? And questions went like this. Jews have a lot of irritating faults. Hollywood is run by Jews. Jews are more willing than others to use shady practices to get what they want. Jews are more loyal to Israel than to America. And it, and it went on like this for another 20 or so questions. That's, that's what it looked like. Now, as you can take a look, what I have here are the means for the two groups. So what you can see here is that participants in the mortality salience condition actually express more anti-Semitic attitudes according to the anti-Semitism scale. They scored higher on the anti-Semitism scale than did the participants in the exam salience or in the control group. All right, that's great. We replicated the mortality salience effect on anti-Semitism. But what about hostility to Israel? Well, what we did was we created a scale of our own, um, which consisted of 10 questions on, again, a one to five Likert scale, 
five here being the most support for Israel, one being the least support. And we, we term this the, the attitudes towards Israel scale. Okay? And, and questions or items went as follows. The Israelis have been terrorized by Arabs for decades. I strongly support the Israeli cause. And the Jews deserve a homeland in Israel. And once again, here are the numbers. Here's the data. Okay? Participants in the mortality salience condition scored significantly lower on the attitudes towards Israel scale, or the support of Israel scale, than did participants in the exam or controlled condition. Okay. Which would suggest that you know people's attitudes towards Israel just went down. Now, it's really hard to tell, right? Why did something like this happen? Why, why would support for Israel go down in the mortality salience condition? Maybe it's because Israel's an outgroup, right? Maybe they're just a minority group. Jews are a minority group, or maybe it's because Israel themselves is a country um, engaged in war and conflict and therefore support for a country engaged in war and conflict went down. So what we did was we, had, we created a scale of parallel construction to the support the Israeli scale, which we called attitudes towards the Palestinian scales. And again, these were 10 parallel questions asking about the Palestinian support for the Palestinians, again on a one to five Likert scale, one being the least support, five being the most support. The questions went like this. The Palestinians have been oppressed by the Israelis for decades. I strongly support the Palestinian cause. The Palestinians deserve a homeland. Once again, here are our results. You now, if you could take a look at those means, they're really not different. There's no difference between those in the experimental mortality salience condition and those in the control exam salience condition. Pretty much the same thing. Well, now we're able to rule out the alternative hypothesis that maybe this has to do with, you know, with minorities in general. Maybe it has to do with the fact that, you know, this is a group engaged in war and conflict. It has nothing to do with that because we didn't get the same results for the Palestinians as we did for the Israelis. So what have we shown with experiment one? Well, first of all, we showed, or we, you know, we, we suggest at least that the mortality salience effect on anti-Semitism has been replicated. Okay? Mortality salience also increased hostility to Israel. Question is, why did this happen? So as you can see, as you can see here by our model, right, mortality salience significantly increases anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism significantly decreases support for Israel, and this accounts for almost half of our model. But what you can also see here from this other path is that mortality salience decreases support for Israel for reasons having nothing to do with anti-Semitism. So once again, we get back to that question, how can we, how can we separate right, criticism of Israel that is versus is not anti-Semitism? We needed another study. Okay. And the assumptions here are that if if support for Israel or hostility towards Israel is indeed anti-Semitism, then maybe this might be why we always see Israel looming so large in the media. I mean, there was a study conducted, there was a, a questionnaire conducted in uh, Europe which asked Europeans who is the biggest single threat to world peace. 60% of them said it was Israel. Above Iran, above China, above Russia, Israel's the greatest threat to world peace. Maybe they don't know what size Israel really is. It's one of the smallest countries in the world. How can it be the greatest threat to world peace? This led us to believe that you know, the fear and hostility often lead people to exaggerate the threat represented by that which they fear. So you've got Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. Right? People were in this fear frenzy where they ran around saying, oh my goodness, he's got this giant arsenal and he's going to blow us up at any time. Let's get him before he gets us. And off to war we went, right? And everyone supported that war at the time. I know people like to deny that now, right? But people supported it at the time, okay? If we take a look at a research experiment, Bullport conducted one back in 1954, where he asked people to estimate the, pop, the Jewish population in South Africa. And what he found was that people who were anti-Semites overestimated the population of the world. Right? A lot more than those who were an anti-Semites. Okay. 
leading to the hypothesis that anti-Semitism leads Israel to loom large and threatening. So let's just take a look. And here we have another political cartoon. You can see that Lee and I really like this political cartoon thing here. You know, too bad Yaakov's not here, right? Right? So yeah, we, we really like this political cartoon thing. And um, here we've got a depiction, right? We've got Ariel Sharon in his beastly-like looking manner devouring Palestinian children. But look, he's this like giant, giant monster stepping on the Palestinians. And not only that, but look, he stepped on the peace process. See the bird? There's that poor dove. And there he is crushing it single-handedly. And here, once again, we've got the giant fist, the giant hand of Israel, crushing Hezbollah, knocking out those Lebanese, and crushing poor President Bush, who's been trying so hard to make peace. So once again, we're, we're crushing that peace process. And here, just to put things into perspective, we have the map of Israel, which, you know, there it is. And there are its neighbors around it. Not, not so big after all, is it? So the prediction then, the hypothesis here is that if this is really the case, that these are, you know, this is some kind of subtle anti-Semitism, then mortality salience should increase the perceived geographic size of Israel, but not that of any other countries, right? So after mortality salience manipulation, people should see Israel as a lot bigger than it really is. So here's what we did. We asked 161 Rutgers intro psych students under either a mortality salience or exam salience condition to judge the size of the following seven countries. Argentina, Great Britain, Japan, Israel, Lebanon, Morocco, and New Zealand. We then asked them, what, what state does country X most resemble in square miles? And we had participants uh, compare them to United States geographic regions just to make these comparisons or judgments a lot easier for them. So the smallest one was, was Delaware, then on to New Jersey, South Carolina, Florida, California, and then the entire West Coast. Okay? The larger you get, right, the higher, the higher the score, the larger the, the, larger the comparison. Okay? So everyone rated the size of all the countries. So this was a within subjects design. They, related, they estimated the size of all these countries. And then we pretty much took their means and we averaged them to form a composite score for each of these countries. Higher means, again, indicate greater perceived size. And let's look at that. Participants rated Israel and only Israel significantly larger under mortality salience than they did any other country. None of the other means are significant. And here what we have is a, a graphical depiction rather than a numerical depiction, just to, again, show the increase in the perceived size in this dramatic effect. So again, as you can see, the largest effect and the largest increase in size is for Israel, and again, the only significant one. Okay. Now, so we confirmed our hypothesis that mortality salience increased the perceived geographic size of Israel and not any other country, but you know what? Um, there are alternative explanations. Luckily for us, our design was able to rule those out. So some might say, well, this happened because Israel's small, but you know what? There are other small countries in this mix. Maybe this happened because Israel is skinny. Well, we picked all of these countries because they were long and skinny. Um, maybe it's because Israel's a democracy. Well, there are other democratic countries here. Maybe it's because they're a US ally. Once again, there are other US allies in this sample. Maybe it's because they're Middle Eastern. Well, we got that covered also. And maybe it's because they're involved in war and conflict. Once again, got that covered. What we weren't able to rule out was the possibility that maybe this is a moral transgression effect. Now, I mentioned moral transgressions before when I talked about the Greenberg et al. studies. And what we said was that mortality salience increases hostility or punishment to people perceived committing some kind of moral transgression. Now, the, the human rights record of Israel and their, and their um, pretty much human rights violations is pretty salient. So an argument here might be, well, you know what? Israeli human rights violations are just a lot more salient than those of all these other countries, and therefore, that's why they were singled out, and that's why they seem so large and threatening. 
said, well, you know what? We need another study. Here we go. So study three basically was, was created to rule out that possibility. So is this a moral transgression effect or not? Well, if this is a moral transgression effect, then everybody, right, the size of everyone or the punishments for everyone should increase under a mortality salience manipulation. So what we did was we gave participants lots of identical information about different countries pertaining to nasty human rights violations. The assumption here is that more extreme punishment for the same offense constitutes a safe outlet for prejudice. I say safe outlet because it's the offense, not the target's group membership, that is the manifest reason for the punishment. And, you know, this way bigots can pretty much hide behind justice as a mask for their prejudices. Nonetheless, right, if a more extreme punishment is imposed for the same exact human rights violation or for the same exact offense, then this absolutely reflects prejudice. Right? If you're gonna be a bigot, at least be an equal opportunity bigot. So here's the prediction. Mortality salience increases support for punishing Israeli moral transgressions more than it increases support for punishing other countries' moral transgressions. And this is simply because mortality salience, as we demonstrated in the first study, as we showed in the first study, increases anti-Semitism, which in turn increases punishment to Israel. Okay. One of the really great things about this particular study is that we use real people. Now, I'm a social psychologist, Lee's a social psychologist, and you should know that one of the biggest things we always get slammed for is, you people aren't conducting real studies. These aren't, this isn't real science you're using. Intro psych students, for goodness sakes. Those aren't real people, what do they know? So we said, well, you know what? If, if we really want to get our point across and show that this is generalizable to the entire population, Let's get some real people. And I'm really sorry that our, that our undergraduate student at the time isn't here because he was really the driving force behind this. What he did was he was able to go out and recruit a doctor's office, which allowed him to sit there for about a month, handing out surveys and, and assigning people to conditions where he got people between the ages of 20 and 50 um, filling out these questionnaires. And he took 235 non-Jewish, non-Hindu participants. I'll explain the non-Hindu part in a minute. Um, waiting to see a doctor in Northern Jersey. Okay. So participants were assigned again, either to a mortality salient or pain salient condition. And then they read an alleged um, Amnesty International story uh, about the country to which they were assigned. So either about Israel or about India. And the story went as follows. The spiraling violence and killings in Israel, or India, and the Palestinian territories, or Kashmir, the past four and a half years has brought untold suffering to the Palestinian, or Kashmiri, civilian populations. It went on like this for three paragraphs. Excessive force against civilians, dramatic deterioration of human rights, grave and long-term consequences. The dependent variable consisted of five questions assessing support for punishing that perpetrator nation. So how am I going to punish Israel for these human rights transgressions? How am I going to punish India for these human rights transgressions? Okay. So we created this little <coughs> survey on a scale of, again, a Likert scale of one to five, one being the, the least agreement, five being the most agreement. And the first question was, form a national campaign against Israel or India. You know, so rally to demonstrate opposition, or a citizen's boycott, right? Boycott their products, a withdrawal of aid, right? Take away their, their military support, their money, governmental economic bans, right? Ban all their products, all their goods, or the most extreme, the installation of a new government. So let's just march on in there and remove their government and start a whole new one. We created one single dependent variable, right? We averaged the scores, created a dependent variable, and here's what we got. You could tell by the, the means, under mortality salience condition, participants' scores increased, right? More for Israel than they did for any other country com committing the same exact human rights violations. Now again, I, I just want to reiterate, 
They read exactly the same thing for both countries, but there was only a significant increase for Israel. Okay? Um, this ruled out all those alternative explanations I talked about before, that the mortality salience effect occurred just because of Israel, Israeli human rights violations were more salient than that of another country. Here they were exactly the same, but yet, once again, we get these differences. Okay? Now, this led us to get another study, right? Very often, Israel is, is, is demonized in, in the newspapers, in political cartoons, and this demonization very often goes beyond simply, you know, criticism of Israel. It, usually, Israelis are depicted as, you know, um, animals, subhuman, literally demons, or even as Nazis. And here's a great example of that. So what we have here is a, a political cartoon from an American artist where you've got this uh, headless soldier wielding a sword and he's pushing this shark-like toothy monster shaped as a, you know, as a star of Israel, as a Jewish star of David. And he's got his sights set on this fleeing Gaza woman holding a baby all embedded in the Israeli flag. Makes Israel look pretty bad. In yet another one where Israelis are depicted as Nazis, we got two panels here. Um, the first one is a Nazi soldier lording over a Jewish child in a concentration camp. Um, and the parallel panel is an Israeli soldier standing amongst the devastation of Gaza or the West Bank. And here we've got a similar idea expressed a little bit differently. We've got the devastation of the Warsaw Ghetto, where approximately half a million Jews were killed, uh, which is being compared in the second panel to the devastation in Janine, where there was a battle and 50 Palestinians were killed. Interesting comparison. Okay. This led us to the assumption that political cartoons that demonize Israel may constitute a safe outlet once again for anti-Semitism. And why a safe outlet? because Israel's real or imagined crimes, rather than being Jewish per se, is the manifest reason for the demonization. The hypothesis, therefore, is that mortality salience will increase how much people agree with cartoons demonizing Israel, but won't have any effect on another country, pretty much with the same type of cartoon. So the experimental design, once again, was a mortality salience, and here we used pain manipulation, um, just to show that we've got, you know, we've got a different kind of manipulation than the exam salient one. So again, just to be more generalizable. Um, and here participants first read a story about the country to which they were assigned, so either to Israel or to China. And it went as follows. Violence against Palestinians or Tibetans by Israeli or Chinese security forces is not new. It has accompanied the occupation for many years. Recently, however, a significant increase in the number of beatings and instances of abuse has occurred. It went on like this, once again, for three paragraphs. Everyone then saw two political cartoons, one for either Israel or China. In the one we termed leader cartoon, you see here a cartoon depicting the Israeli leader eating Palestinian children. Or in China, condition, you see a cartoon depicting the Chinese leader eating Tibetan children. Again, you can see that. Identical cartoons. And the one we call the world cartoon, you've got a victorious Jew holding an Israeli flag atop a victorious world, bleeding world with a surrendering Palestinian beneath. You see the little white flag? Right? In the identical cartoon, you see a Chinese man, a victorious Chinese man, holding a Chinese flag atop a bleeding world, a bleeding world with, a, with a surrendering Tibetan mini. So once again, identical cartoons. Okay. They were then given three questions on how justified they believed these cartoons to be. So one, on a Likert scale of one to five, one being not very, five being very. Questions went like this. Do you believe this representation to be an accurate portrayal of the Israeli-Palestinian or Chinese-Tibetan conflict. Based on the passage you just read, how justified is the following cartoon, and do you find this cartoon offensive? I have a feeling you guys know it's coming, right? Okay, so 
for the for the leader cartoon, just by looking, you could see that we've got only one group here that's really different or significantly different. Participants in the mortality salience group viewed the cartoon of the Israeli leader as more justified. This didn't happen for China. Same thing with the cartoon we called the world domination cartoon. Once again, only the Israeli cartoon was justified under the mortality salience manipulation. Okay. Basically, what we did here was, you know, the operational hypotheses were here confirmed. Okay, so all taken together, what are these summaries? What are these? Uh, what do these studies show us, or what do these studies suggest? Well, in study one, it suggests that it increases explicit self-reported anti-Semitism, right? So participants score higher on the anti-Semitism scale in study one. In study, in study two, Israel is perceived to be larger than it actually is, but not other countries. In study three, it increases support for punishing Israeli transgressions more than it increases support for punishing other other identical transgressions of another country. And in study four, it increases perceived justification of offensive political cartoons of Israel, but not of China. And once again, in study one, we showed that anti-Semitism at least partially explains why mortality salience increases hostility to Israel. And the really the most important thing here is this is the first scientific evidence that at least that we know that, dem that, that suggests that anti-Semitism fuels at least some, maybe not all, at least some of the hostility directed at Israel. Now, it, it's, important to, you know, it's important to talk about not only what we found, but also what we haven't found. So we have not demonstrated that has all hostility to Israel reflects anti-Semitism. Okay. Um, neither did we create extreme eliminationist anti-Semitism in our 30-minute studies. We, we just couldn't do that. Um, our outcomes were all attitudes. We didn't assess any of their behaviors. And as I mean, social psychologists know, I see you nodding your head, that very often our behaviors and our attitudes might differ. So we didn't assess behaviors. Um, also, mortality salience alone, or terror management theory, is not an end-all explanation for anti-Semitism. There might be other theories that explain anti-Semitism, and we're not claiming that mortality salience is the only way to manipulate anti-Semitism. Um, and, and the last thing that really must be noted is that we're not claiming that Americans walk around hating Jews or Israel, because that's really just not the case. As a matter of fact, the attitudes, at least according to our studies, were quite positive for both Jews and Israel when not under mortality salience. Okay. It's very difficult, as Lee had mentioned earlier, it's very difficult sometimes to identify uh, blatant and subtle forms of anti-Semitism, but we think that we now have, at least from these studies, a better handle on how to detect these forms of anti-Semitism. So, extreme and disproportionate criticism of Israel that's not applied to other countries committing those same human rights violations equally, that's anti-Semitism. Depicting Israel and Israeli supporters as, you, as looming supernaturally large and threatening, or maybe even as dominating the world, I think we can consider that anti-Semitism, right? Singularly depicting Israel, Israelis, Israeli leaders, leaders, or even Israeli and Jewish symbols as despicable, revolting, and nauseating, right? That can be anti-Semitism. Now, if I had to end this talk with one single take-home message, it would pretty much be that um, hostility to Israel can be considered anti-Semitism when it is virulent hostility that seems to go beyond opposition and disagreement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a really impressive, exhaustive uh, <laughs> study. No, I don't mean exhaustive. Do <laughs> I look like I'm falling down? <laughs> very detailed, you know, analytical point. You know, I, I'll just make one point, and maybe it's you know, the, you know, talking to social psychologists, this may be the ego. But the first study to actually make the link between anti-Israel, or we call it Israel bashing, and then contemporary anti or classical anti-Semitism was the article by Luke Kaplan. Right. Um, so this is, it's a very powerful, I think, uh, reinforcement of what we, I know, touched on. 
Well, um, you're cited in the paper so I know, I know. Who <laughs> <laughs> knows? Um, so I have a series of questions, but it, it's sort of slightly off the topic. So I think you, you, you no, maybe we'll start in that later. But it, is it more on the paper? Because I want to yeah. take what you did yeah, on the paper yeah, yeah, and go yeah. somewhere. It's on the paper. It's on the paper. Okay, so you can see what no, oh, the, the fourth right? study, just let me mention, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if you, if you noticed or not, the fourth study wasn't part of the paper. This is a brand new study, right. came out of my <laughs> dissertation, and I'm, I'm currently working on it for publication. Okay. That is fascinating. I have, I have like 100 questions. 100 questions. Okay. She's a social so, psychologist. So, so. Yeah, yeah, so I'm one of the study, and I told you before. I would, I would ask you, like, uh, did you think, because, like, but I'm sure that, um, um, TMT explains what's going towards Israel. But, so this is one case. But then the question is why, why uh, it's, it's of course it's not the only case, but then the question is why Israel? Why is this association between uh, threat, uh, you know, uh, life threat and hostility towards Israel? And so, it's, so the model doesn't explain the historical connection uh, like uh, the protocols of Zion and so forth. Oh, so what I would do, Zion. So, so what I would do, I, I would, uh, or, we, or we would do together, maybe, is like to to, uh, to study the direct association between uh, Jews and uh, and uh, Jews and threat. So and then this association could activate. So like the opposite direction. You said you said that TMT activates anti-Semitism. I said maybe, maybe Jews activate anti-Semitism. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe it's the opposite. Maybe just uh, they they are. Uh, the reminder of Jew is is associated with uh, with hostility, with threat, with, from different reasons. The reminder of Jew, yeah, or the reminder of Israel. The reminder of Jew, and then and then so the, or two associations. So so this this is an association, and then different cases activate this association. Itself, because because I understand this because because your model doesn't explain why Israel. It explains that under under threat there is hostility, but it doesn't explain why. We have. We agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. 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 That's a very strong statement. Okay. <laughs> we completely agree with that. That that is um, uh, a sort of uh, major underlying question, right? That, that, that you know. So why why does this play itself out on Jews? And now originally we selected mortality salience as our manipulation, because what we were interested in was ratcheting up anti-Semitism in the lab, and it had the sort of best track record for doing that. So, um, I mean, in fact, I would actually, even in response to what you're, you, you guys were the first to provide the link, I would say we provided the first, the strongest evidence of a causal link. You know, and I think I would put it that way. And the causal link being? From anti-Semitism to hostility in Israel. 